Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to continue talking about monetary policy. We're going to graph and analyze contractionary monetary policy, and we're going to use um, a historical example from not that long ago, the 2008 economic crisis. Um, after the September 11th terrorist attack, um, you can see here that the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank, lowered interest rates uh, so to incentivize households and firms to borrow and spend into the economy to avoid a deep recession. So the interest rate fell from you know, over 6% to 1.75% approximately um, in 2004. Okay, so we see that gradual decrease in interest rates, which is what we call expansionary monetary policy, which is what we've covered in a previous video. Um, the low interest rates led to households borrowing and spending, and in this case, it led to investment spending in the purchase of brand new homes. So we can see in this home price index from 1890 onward, that housing prices were really skyrocketing in the lead up to 2005. And that's a result of the low interest rates, people borrowing and buying brand new apartments, houses, um, buying perhaps old homes, which is not a part of GDP. Uh, only brand new housing is part of GDP. But uh, borrowing that money and perhaps buying an old home, renovating it and trying to sell it for a higher price. Uh, there was increased aggregate demand for housing, and we see that increased aggregate demand was leading to housing prices really rising. So that was taking the U.S. economy into an inflationary gap. And to try to slow that down, we can see that the Federal Reserve, in the lead up to 2000, 2005, was raising interest rates um, you know, over that time period from 2004 to 2007, but it was too late, all right? Then we went into the economic uh, crisis of um, 2008, and then again, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates to incentivize borrowing and spending. So we're gonna look at this period here where the housing prices are taking off in the lead up to the 2008 economic crisis, and the Federal Reserve trying to slow that down by raising interest rates. So let's go ahead and illustrate this. Monetary policy, is part of demand side policies. We're, we're looking specifically at the role of the central bank, not the central government, but the central bank in trying to influence aggregate demand. And since they're trying to influence aggregate demand, we call it a demand side policy. We'll be graphing uh, an inflationary gap and then closing it through contractionary monetary policy. In graph A, we have the money market, and in graph B, we have a monetarist model, okay? So let's just break this down and explain the inflationary gap first. So in graph A, we have the money market. We're measuring the quantity of money on the x-axis and the rate of interest on the y-axis. We have a perfectly inelastic supply curve or supply of money curve labeled SM1. And we have a downward sloping demand for money labeled DM1. And the intersection of the two where SM1 equals DM1 at point A provides an equilibrium interest rate at IR1, which we will assume will be 1.75%, very low interest rate as a result of expansionary monetary policy with a quantity supply and demanded at QM1. Graph B, we have a monetarist model. We're measuring real GDP on the x-axis, price level on the y-axis, a downward sloping aggregate demand curve, an upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve, a perfectly inelastic long-run aggregate supply curve. All of these three curves intersecting at point A, providing an equilibrium price level at PL1 and full potential GDP at YP. And let's assume that at this point, um, the United States is at its natural rate of unemployment, which is the sum of structural, frictional, and seasonal unemployment. And let's assume that the long-run average rate of unemployment in the United States is at about 5%. Okay. So the low interest rate at 1.75%, as we saw on that chart in 2003, 2004, 
was encouraging households and even firms to borrow and spend into the economy. We want to remember that aggregate demand is the sum of consumption spending, investment spending, plus government spending, plus exports minus imports. And the low interest rates led to increased borrowing and spending by households. And when households were buying brand new apartments and um, housing houses, that's, a, that's considered investment spending. So investment spending was rising, times were good. And that causes aggregate demand to increase. So here we're gonna illustrate it shifting outward from 81 to 82. So that creates a new intersection at point B where 82 equals SRS1. And that leads to an increase in real GDP from YP to, we'll call it Y inflation, income or spending at inflation. Because of the increased aggregate demand, firms begin to increase the quantity of their aggregate supply, as we can see along the short run aggregate supply curve from point A to point B. And in order to increase the quantity of aggregate supply, they have to employ more resources like labor. Even construction companies were scrambling for labor, competing against each other to get the last remaining units of labor. Um, and we see that the unemployment rate was falling. Let's just assume that it fell to about 3%. That should have been a signal that the US economy is entering an inflationary gap. In addition, we see that the average prices of goods and services, but in particular homes, is rising from PL1 to PL2. So the US economy is overheating. Right, that increase in aggregate demand is leading to an inflationary gap, unemployment less than the natural rate. That should be a signal that we're entering an inflationary gap and the rising price of goods and services, or in this case, housing. So the central bank sees this data and they want to intervene to slow it down. They want to slow down this, this bubble. And they can do that through what we call contractionary monetary policy, where they're contracting the supply of money. All right, so by decreasing the supply of money from SM1 to SM2, they can effectively increase the interest rate. All right, that sets a new equilibrium from point A to point B, and that raises the interest rates from IR1 to IR2. Now let's go back and look at that data. So we can see that interest rate rising and it's going to about somewhere over 5%. So let's just say 5% interest rates. All right, so we're gonna say, we're gonna assume that it's hitting about 5%, okay, at point B. So how do they um, reduce the supply of money. Well, in expansionary monetary policy, we learned that they will buy government bonds. They will buy government bonds from the central government and provide cash to the central government to spend into the economy. Well, this will just be the opposite. Instead of buying government bonds, they will be selling government bonds back to the central government and other investors. And as they sell those government bonds, they are withdrawing money from the economy. So the supply of money in decreases from SM1 to SM2, where SM2 equals DM1 at point B. It provides a higher interest rate at IR2, interest rates rising from 1.75% to 5%. And the quantity supplied and demanded of money decreasing from QM1 to QM2. So by doing that, they're hoping to reduce aggregate demand, to push it back, reduce consumption spending. All right. So the higher interest rate makes money more expensive to borrow, so firms and households are borrowing less and spending less, and thus 80 would, 82 would be shifting back into 81. That was the goal. Unfortunately, 
uh, 82 just shifted straight into a recessionary gap. So let's go ahead and analyze this as we would for an IB paper exam. As can be seen, we have two graphs, graph A being a money market graph and graph B a mantras model, and where we will uh, illustrate the creation and closing of an, of an inflationary gap through contractionary monetary policy. In graph A, we're measuring the quantity of money on the x-axis, the rate of interest on the y-axis. In graph B, we're measuring real GDP on the x-axis and the price level on the y-axis. In graph A, we have a downward sloping demand for money curve labeled DM1 and two perfectly inelastic supply of money curves labeled SM1 and SM2. In graph B, we have two downward sloping aggregate demand curves labeled 81 and 82, an upward short aggregate supply curve, and a perfectly inelastic LRES curve labeled LRES1. So in, the, uh, in graph B, where LRES1 equals 81 equals short run aggregate supply curve 1 at point A, it establishes an equilibrium price level at PL1 and equilibrium level of real GDP at YP with unemployment at 5%. In graph A, graph A, the money market where SM1 equals DM1 at point A provides an interest rate at IR1 a low interest rate at 1.75% as a result of expansionary monetary policy and providing a quantity supplied and demanded of money at QM1. As a result of the low interest rate at 1.75%, that incentivizes households and firms to borrow money that is cheap to borrow and spend into the economy, in this case on housing. So consumption spending rises, investment spending rises, and since they are a component of aggregate demand, it causes aggregate demand to increase from 81 to 82. That creates a new equilibrium in the short run where 82 equals SRS1 at point B, increasing real GDP from YP to Y inflation, and also raising the price level from PL1 to PL2. Since firms are responding to the increased aggregate demand by increasing their quantity of aggregate supply, they begin to employ more units of labor Thus, unemployment falls from 5 to 3%. The central bank sees that the price level is rising and perhaps unemployment data is falling, signaling that the economy is going to an inflationary gap. So the central bank intervenes by utilizing contractionary money, monetary policy. They're going to contract the supply of money. So instead of uh, buying government bonds, they're selling government bonds back to the central government and other investors, thus withdrawing money from the economy. So the supply of money thus decreases from SM1 to SM2, where SM2 equals DM1 at point B, provides a higher rate of interest at IR2, where increasing interest rates from 1.75% to 5%, and as a result of the higher interest rate, it reduces the quantity supplied and demanded of money from QM1 to QM2. Since it is more costly for households and firms to borrow, uh, they are borrowing less and thus spending less into the economy. So consumption, investment spending falls. That causes aggregate demand to fall from 82 back to 81 at point A back to full potential. And because firms are reducing the quantity of their aggregate supply, they will fire excess labor, leading to a slight rise in unemployment from 3 to 5%. Okay, so that is an illustration of contractionary monetary policy and how to close an inflationary gap through that monetary policy. In the next video, we will do the same thing, but on a Keynesian model. If you have any questions, feel free to comment and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.